So greetings and welcome to today's educational program. Managing for Quality Lecture Series number 14, Quality as an Economic Imperative by Dr. Gregory H. Watson. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with ASQ's Quality Management Division. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Watson. He has degrees in Management, Law, and Industrial Engineering. He's an 18-year ASQ Fellow and past chair from 2000. In 2020, Dr. Watson was elected as an honorary member of ASQ, its highest honor. Previously, he's received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal and the Lancaster, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member by 19 other national quality organizations. He's been a frequent speaker for various ASQ conferences, and he's delivered this webinar series for QMD since early 2020. He's a former quality executive for Hewlett Packard, Compact Computer, and Xerox, and he's coached executives in quality transformations in Nokia Mobile Phones, Toshiba, ExxonMobil, and over 20 other companies. Dr. Watson is the only Westerner to be awarded a Deming Medal by the Union of Japanese Scientists and Engineers. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doug. Seems like we've been doing this for a long time now. <laughs> Uh, so today we're going to talk about managing for quality in another dimension. Uh, the first 12 lectures we're talking about what I will call micro quality, the, the quality within a company or organization. And what we're, we're going to talk about is a concept now of macro quality. And this is quality for humanity. And, and this part of the series has uh, six lectures. We talked about quality as an environmental mandate. Now we'll talk about economics. The next uh, four sessions, we'll talk about social responsibility, human rights, uh, political policy, and manifest destiny. And the idea is that, that what I'm trying to do is expand our thinking from the micro-quality world where we all work on a regular basis to a global level. So how does quality work for the benefit of humanity? Now, when we talk about this quality as, as an, a, a mandate, there are three words uh, that I want to focus on. Quality, economic, and imperative. So what is an imperative? An imperative is something that is mandatory. It's vitally important. It requires a sense of urgency for us to address. It's also an essential element. It's an indispensable component of the whole. It's a compulsory activity or an obligatory action that's necessary, and it's absolutely critical. It's a necessary response that cannot be avoided. So when we're talking about this, it's an imperative that requires action. It suggests a situation or circumstances that must change. When we talk about economic, what we're saying to, it's something that's pertaining to the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. It's a generation of income or revenue, savings, and investments. And it's a system of production and consumption of resources. So we're talking about this economics encompasses the, the financially based study of national, personal, commercial, and governmental resources and the exchanges of those resources. When we talk about quality, we'll use the same definition that I offered in the beginning of these uh, 12 lectures, where we have this transcendental definition of quality, sort of a meta definition that stands above all of these things that we can apply everywhere, both in the microeconomic domain and macro. And that is that quality is a relentless pursuit of goodness coupled tightly with the persistent avoidance of badness. So the core principles in this are we're respecting people in their diversity of race, religion, nationality. We're respecting the scientific gains of those who've walked before us. And so they've established the settled knowledge we have of quality, which we uh, have now, uh, inherited, if you will, from those uh, forefathers. And we also are gonna be protecting the environment which sustains all of us. So that means we have a forward-looking idea of goodness for the earth. And we want to abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm and practice two things in every activity we do. Either we help or we do no harm. So we're talking about quality. We mean goodness that is careful not to create any unintended consequences as it works to improve our lives. When I listened about economics. One of the things that I want to start from came from Frederick uh, Bassett in, in 1850. He wrote an essay, that which we see and that which we do not see. 
And in it, he talked about what's called the broken window fallacy. So this little graphic here is, is a broken window. And he talks about a little boy who broke a window. And the cost of repair then is considered to be an economic benefit to society. Some work is being done, that's a positive thing. Money is being paid, so that is economic gain. But here's a question. What if that boy was hired by the glazier, the person who makes the glass, to break it? Would that still be an economic gain? Because it was done under, if you will, false pre, uh, uh, pretenses. Uh, and, and this parable, uh, there's one part that's benefiting society and another part where there's a loss. The window is broken. So there's an economic loss ha happening in order to create the economic activity that benefits the society. What happened if someone burned down a city? How would we calculate that loss? How does the economic loss then balance against the gains that would happen from reconstruction of that city? And, and what happens here is there's a morale. What we see is that society is losing the value of things which are uselessly destroyed. In other words, destruction should not result in profit or economic gain. So what we see in the broken window fallacy is a lesson. An increase in one part of the economy can create a loss in another, and that can create a ripple effect of what's going on. So we can see some examples of this, but it, it all comes down to, to thinking about how we manage risks. And we talk about risks, we talk about this, and I've, I've mentioned this in the last session, so I'll just go through this quickly, but Anthropocene risk, it's human risk. And so we see there's risk from hazards, vulnerability, as well as exposure. And what we're seeing is that the risk is changing in, in terms of the baseline of the hazards we have. There's a socio-ecological risk and changing the focus of the risk in terms of the world. And there's also some cross-scale integration, changing the basis of risk production. So managing risk will become a dominant emphasis in quality to continually improve the environment. And one of my favorite uh, authors that I like to read is, is the quantum physicist Richard Feynman. And he said, if we want to solve a problem we've never solved before, we have to leave the door to the unknown ajar. And, and I think of this when it turns to quality. We have to think of quality in a way that is different to what the quality community has traditionally thought of. And so the question that comes, how do we think differently about it? So if we're connecting quality to the economy, how does quality relate to economics, accounting, and finance? Now we have two different components of economics. There's macroeconomics, and that's providing for needs of society. It's distributing wealth. This happens through tax and monetary policy. And we measure this with gross domestic product per person or per capita. We talk about microeconomics, we're talking about increasing sales in an organization or reducing costs in an organization. That's dealing with things like capital investments and, and it, it's looking at measures of profitability and productivity. And both of these can have an impact, impact on the quality of life of people as individuals or on society as a whole. And so this is the perspective that we'd like to take a look at. Now, we have been working in, in most of our careers in terms of productivity, uh, reducing cost of goods sold, if you will, eliminating waste, improving quality, reducing cost of poor quality, all of those are microeconomic indicators. And so this is, is a way of looking at the society in a different way. So it's aggregating or bringing together all of those microeconomic indicators and saying, what's happening in the nation as a whole? And, and this, this coronavirus has seen that, that uh, Cause us to see our economic systems very differently. You see economic systems in America affected differently than in Europe and in different than South America or Africa. And we start seeing all of these things merging together as a global system. And so our question is going to be, how do we have this imperative? That, you know, what are the elements of it to redefine quality? And there are some macro quality imperatives. So we see inequality of wealth distribution. We see pollution in the environment. We see insecurity around our job situations. In numeracy, people can't even interpret the numbers that are given to them about society. There's unemployment and risk in job security, prejudice about how people are working. We see poverty, illiteracy, disease, famine, hunger, war. And in all of these cases, we want to do two things, like to increase the level of social goodness and decrease the level of social badness. 
And so as we're looking at these things, we see macroeconomics needs to expand its concept. And I believe it needs to align with the Taguchi loss function by considering the uncounted cost of the loss to society as it defines economic productivity as a nation. So accounting principles require subtracting expenditures and losses from revenue in order to determine gross returns. But economic calculations of society's benefits should follow a similar rule and take into effect the total cost to society when it estimates how well an economy is actually performing. And we see economic theory then must be extended to include macro quality as a supplement to the way it applies micro quality in the nature of a firm. So that means we as a professional quality community need to think more broadly, how will we work in this macro domain, not just in the micro domain where we have brought up and our careers have been based. So we have sort of two challenges. The first challenge is understanding what they really mean by macroeconomics. And then the second challenge is how does that apply when we start thinking about quality? What is the, the role of quality in that macroeconomic domain? So the first part of what I want to talk about is I want to spend some time going over macroeconomic theory as I see it applying to quality. Now I've, I've chosen some of the, if you will, the uh, key ingredients in terms of the changes that have happened in macroeconomic quality. And so I want to talk about those so we can all have that basic foundation. And classical economic theory began with Adam Smith. He's really the father of, of modern economics in the sense when he wrote The Wealth of Nation, which was published in 1777. And that characterized the mechanisms that govern most of modern economics. And, and some of the, the principal theories that were in his pioneering book included the division of labor between working class, those who do the work, and the masters, those who, who plan the economic activities. And for us in quality, that was the beginning of the plan, do, check, act model. Check came in play when, when Taylor was talking about the, the role of the inspectors in his principles of scientific management. The act came in when we're talking about uh, Kuru Ishikawa and the Japanese concept of quality. Now, if everybody does what's best for themselves, then it's best for society. That was one of his beliefs. And so if you maximize your personal utility, what you do with your money, how you spend it, what you get for it, then that should theoretically maximize the benefit for society. And so he said that economics are governed by an invisible hand in the free market. And the forces that are way, this implies that the government must act in what they call a laissez-faire manner. So laissez-faire is, is French, and it means hands off. And that means government intervention should not be used to upset the natural market forces. That natural market forces will balance themselves out over the end. And in 1929, the Great Depression obliterated this confidence in social, uh, in classical economic theory uh, around macro economics because what had to happen was laissez-faire economics had to be set aside and there had to be some sort of stimulation of the economy a revisionist thinking about how economics operates in broad applications for broad natural policy and, and so what we start seeing is that the standard of wealth that that he was talking to was basically just limited to labor what labor could a person purchase and so the basic concepts we have about productivity, national productivity, were based on production per person. So gross domestic product per capita per person. We take a look inside of macro, microeconomics. And, and what we see is, is we see productivity per person in terms of a manufacturing measure. So those standard measures all were based on Adam Smith's classical economic theory where we see the human being as the unit of labor and the unit of economic benefit. Now things changed. And, and so macroeconomic theory grew out of this. And, and the economic concern here is with large scale general factors like interest rates and, and national productivity. And it developed actually in 1936 after the Great Depression. And John Maynard Keynes uh, was, was the person who created this and it, it uh, also, uh, in his book, The General Theory of uh, Employment, Interest, and Money, uh, money uh, and, and it's now called the Keynesian Economic Philosophy, and it's basically saying we're going to get beyond the microeconomic conditions. 
So when we go back to what all the study that was happening before this period of time, it was within the company. So, so we had bookkeeping accounting, we had managerial accounting, and all of that was basically saying, how do we keep track of things within the company? What was happening in the mid-1930s was the Depression was coming over, Franklin Roosevelt was president, and he needed to create a stimulus for the economy so that we get going again. And what stimulates an economy is trade and sales, so people exchange and money is moving. So if money's not moving, it's stagnant. And so that's that's a bad economic condition. And so what what uh, Kansas started talking about is you know how do we start balancing supply and demand on a macro scale across the whole thing? And and, and he he believed that aggregate demand will not always match the supply produced. In other words, we start producing more and more of something, but not everybody wants to buy it. So we'll have obsolescence, things that do not sell in the marketplace. So when I was at, at uh, Nokia Mobile Phones consulting to them in 1998, we produced uh, approximately a half a million too many phones in that year, and that created a glut of products. So the, the, the consumption rate did not actually match the supply we produced, and that creates a problem for a company in terms of loss of sales. So a laissez-faire economic policy may require intervention, and there are two ways that intervention can happen. One is called fiscal policy, and the other is called monetary policy. Now, fiscal policy is about how governments influence the direction that it, uh, uh, the economy changes, either by spending or by taxing. So, so spending is, uh, if you will, increasing the revenue that, that's available uh, to be passed around in the private uh, economy. It's putting more money in people's hands, and taxing is taking it away. So the, the monetary policy is the, the activity of a central bank. And what they do is they supply the, uh, the, the money that's there, and then they set the interest rates when need, money is needed for lending in the economy. So we see that macroeconomics is actually the study of how economic factors influence the way society operates. So what I want to do now is, is that's the general idea. And what I want to do is start with John Maynard Keynes and take a look at what some of the key people in the development of macroeconomics have had to say. So Keynesian economics is the foundation for modern uh, economic theory. And he made the comment that markets are imperfect mechanisms. They do not always self-correct. And he challenged the classical theory that uh, came from, from Adam Smith that free markets would, in the short term, automatically provide full employment if workers were to be flexible in their labor demands. And what that meant was you're willing to take not full labor, but part-time labor. You're also willing to take a lower salary, not the salary that you were paid before. And so we see wage reduction in recessions and excessive savings are considered in his system economic threats. So government fiscal policy must offset fluctuations in the business cycle. So when, when sales go up and down, that the government policy in monetary uh, fiscal policy how the government spends and, and taxes needs to offset that so Keynes came in and said governance spending can create a multiplier effect so it will cause an economy either to spiral upwards towards growth and that means investment in infrastructure assures that uh, there's capital to invest in highways bridges trains airport and that places money in the hands of investors which drives markets uh, and, and monetary transfer to individuals Economic equilibrium is a balance between the dimensions of savings and investments, and it's, it's the liquidity preference and mon money supply. So this requires government intervention. It's not really say fair. It, balance is not achieved by a hands-off situation. So John Maynard Keynes said the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from the old ones, that we are, are not really ready to get rid of those old ideas. And what we start seeing is now there's going to be a succession of people that basically are monitor, uh, modifying the thinking of John Maynard Keynes in different ways. So the first of these was Milton Friedman. The Milton Friedman was what's called the Chicago School of, of Economics, the University of Chicago. And he talked about the theory of monetary supply and spending. And he says that more money in the economy results in higher spending and vice versa. So less money in the economy, lower spending. And we get this stagnation. So monetary policy is managing economies' uh, money supply, and that's governed by the central bank. 
This plays a, a crucial role in, in the national economy because governments spend the money on projects to benefit society, fiscal policy, and this is need to, to balance, if you will, economic stability on the other side of this. And Friedman postulated a demand-driven concept of monetary supply as the means to stabilize uh, prices and, and reduce unwanted effects of inflation or reduction in, in uh, socially distributed wealth. So the shortage of money supply is a key driver in recession because it limits the consumerism of individuals. And we've gone through this this year. If you don't have money in your pocket, you don't spend money. You only spend it on those things that are necessary. While controlling supply and demand may have a controlling influence on economic structure, this may have an unintended effect on global trade and international economics exchange. So if we start changing the supply of money, what that will do is it will make it it's less likely to trade and buy from other countries and more likely to turn internally to our own work. Friedman had some, some very interesting quotations. He said, the government solution to a problem is usually as bad as the problem itself. But he wasn't a believer that government intervention by itself would solve everything. And he also said that inflation is taxation without legislation. And what that's meaning is, Yes, you have more value in terms of money by face value, but it's actually worth less in terms of purchasing power parity. In other words, it's not buying as much for you. So it's just like taxation takes money away from you, inflation takes buying power away from you. And he's also famous for saying there's no such thing as a free lunch. If we get money, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is coming without cost. The next person that I want to talk about is Robert Lucas Jr., and he talked about what's called rational economic theory. And, and, and these are rational expectations which drive economics and economics then drives history. And he framed his performance expectation based on the available information we have to formulate a prediction about future prices and quantities and how they'll act to develop some sort of expected lifetime utility function for that commodity. He says, in the long term, there is a neutrality of money as explained by a correlation between economic output and inflation. But he built a, a macroeconomic model based on aggregated version of microeconomic models. He took all the company models and tried to put them together. And Lucas believed that people can be deceived in their economic thinking by unsystematic uh, monetary supply. So if we don't get really uh, an understanding of things, if we have more money, we think things are great. But that money is not necessarily worth what it is, uh, if you will, over the long term. So we might see the stock market going up, which is a summation of all microeconomic value, but that may not necessarily reflect on what's happening. So he critiqued economic policy making and relationship between inflation and unemployment and, and said that th this could change as a result of uh, changes in uh, government's economic policy. And uh, he drove the move towards establishing microeconomic foundations of microeconomic theory. So rational expectations are assumptions that are consistent within a singular economic model. And it's, it's managing uncertainty to assure that the model operates in a consistent way on average. Now, we also see that, that these people then were combining into what became called a neoclassical synthesis. Uh, or DSGE model, where DSGE stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Model. So in, in the original world of, of, uh, of John Maynard Keynes, we had a, a static economic equilibrium. And then people said, no, it's changing over time. Lots of things are changing in terms of the inputs and outputs in that economy. And they're changing in a way based on probability theory. So we have probability there. Now, John Maynard Keynes did write book early in his career, he was a mathematician, he did write a, a very good book on theory of probability somewhere around 1916. And st stochastic methods are probabilistic changes in the inputs or outputs. And we see this real business cycle is what's represented by variation in stock market prices. And, and it's an efficient uh, response to external influences that are changing the national economy. So there's a rough correlation in general between stock market prices and how an economy is doing. And national economic output is maximizing expected utility. That means the economic choice based on the risk tolerance of the people and the personal preferences they have for how they would like to, to invest their money. So this um, 
a real business cycle in combination with Keynesian e economics produces this DSGE model. And so we're integrating demand and supply components with monetary policy and, and, and on the microeconomic foundations. Uh, so it's all, all the businesses coming together. And this probability model is dynamic and it's incorporating frictions from tax distortions, the presence of consumer habits, uh, adjusted cost of investments and adjustments to labor costs based on changes in employment. And these models today are used and applied by central banks and they're thought to track more clearly the shocks of change that are happening that stabilize an economy. So these models make it possible to combine a rigorous microeconomic treatment to derive a plausible macroeconomic treatment, but that still is just based on probability theory. So it's just based on some rough boundaries with some confidence intervals around it about how well the economy will be doing based on what's happening in the microeconomy. Now, the, the next person to come along is Robert Solo. Now, he is a modern economist, and he talked about growth theory. He, he's a, a professor of, of economics at the Sloan School of Management at MIT. And, and Solo is known for, for some advances in regression analysis, but, but most importantly, he's known for his economic model. And, and he worked with Paul Samuelson, who was a classic economist at MIT, and the two of them were basically part of the, the MIT School of Economics. And Solo's model determines economic growth based on the outputs of supply, demand, and technological progress. So he's adding technology in. And the model also calculates growth based on different vintages of capital investment. That was when was the money invested, where new capital is thought to be more valuable than old capital because the old capital was produced based on old technology. And, and, and there's more risk, if you will, inherent in that because it was invested under greater technological uncertainty when technology was still in its infancy. And, and new capital is invested with more modern technology, which is better known. So Solo's model assumes that known technology is constantly improving. And the decline in price of capital goods estimates then technological progress. So if we start taking a look at, at a piece of capital equipment, so, so uh, an injection molding machine may have cost a quarter of a million dollars when it first came out. Five years later, it's down to 200,000. A couple of years later, it's down to 100,000. And this is, is what he is saying is mapping, if you will, what, what we think of as Moore's law in terms of this reduction in terms of, of, of price, mapping, if you will, along with technological progress. So the economic question posed by the model relates to the ability of an economy to produce enough capital to replace the aging invested capital. So what we're doing is we are replacing the assets that were already invested, previously invested, with new assets. So today we're replacing production lines that were manual with robots. And so we have different cost factors, but that's basically saying technology has moved forward, and so we're gonna change the way we actually are doing production as a result. So, so Solo's model is used to, to measure technological progress as an aggregate of the production function of society. And this model is very well aligned with Joseph Schumpeter's emphasis on innovation as planned abandonment of legacy systems through a process he called creative destruction, getting rid of the old systems so that we can make way for the new ones. So, so we're getting much more benefit out of those new ones according to Slolo. And he made a comment, which I don't believe he would hold to anymore, but this was in the early 1990s. He said, you see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. So it used to be that we spent lots of money on computers, but we didn't see any change in productivity. And this is one of the challenges that we have in the Quality 4.0 movement, is that what we're seeing is that computers now are driving the productivity because we're actually doing things that increase rates of production and ability at the same time to assure that that production is actually making products that are good and meet quality standards. The final person I want to talk about is Joseph Stiglitz. And, and, and Stiglitz is, is a, a gentleman who was talking about information economic theory. And, and here we're changing the focus of economics to consider the price of inequality. And he said that in the presence of increasing profitability as a function of investment, the entry of firms into a market is too small. And that which consumers prefer diversity, the size of the market is too big. So two things can happen. If we have uh, investments 
we're not going to get many companies entered, entered because there's too much of an investment. However, if there's too small an investment, we get so many people entering the market that consumers, you know, they want diversity, but they won't be able to get the capability of those organizations. So what we start seeing is that incomplete information is inhibiting markets from achieving a social efficiency. And development must not just transform economies, but it also has to transform people's lives. So two observations support his evaluation that unemployment is driven by infrastructure, uh, the information structure of employment. The first is that unlike other forms of capitals, humans can choose their level of effort. Do I really want to work full time? So many of you like myself may be you know, working out of your houses now because of COVID. And then we get to choose how much of our time do we really support working, uh, doing these jobs, or do we, do we want to, to accept the lower wage? So we become more flexible in that choice. And the second component is that it's costly for firms to determine how much effort workers are exerting. And this is another challenge companies are finding out is if we have our workforce at home, are they really doing the work? You know, how much effort do they put into that for the wages that we're paying them? So, so wages do not fall during a recessionary period as there's a probability that the workforce will, will shrink because the workers can choose their level of effort. The firms cannot cut wages until unemployment rises sufficiently. So this is creating, if you will, a, a dynamic effect because firms need to get better information. And the, the macroeconomic effect of these fiscal aspects of microeconomics will change as a function of information fidelity, how good the information is, and quality. And what Stiglitz says, rather than justice for all, we are evolving into a system of justice for those who can afford it. We have banks that are not only too big to fail, but also too big to be held accountable. So Stiglitz's work is in the last two decades. And, and he's seen what happened when we had the bank crisis in 2008. And we would put the banks through the different types of stress tests and see how well will they actually perform. But in reality, as a reliability engineer, I would say they weren't really stressed at all. They're talking only about a few percent, five to 10% changes in their flows, not talking about massive changes that could happen when there is a social, total social disruption. And so we start seeing from, from all of this about this, this uh, macroeconomics, there are some uncertainties and, and limitations. And so what we start seeing is that in, in this macroeconomic world, importance is not assigned to individual economic units. So statistically, we'd, we'd say that this is uh, an analytic perspective. It's just like looking at the time series. But what macroeconomics is, it looks at everything collective. So it's looking at the whole sum of society. And that's like economic, uh, excuse me, enumerative analysis of statistics. And Deming warned us about the two. He says causation comes from understanding the analytic perspective, but we can evaluate risk from an enumerative perspective. So we have to think, which of these uh, ways should we be looking at the effects? And so we start seeing collective economics pronouncements may overestimate some factors while underestimating others, even if generally it's collect, correct in the aggregate. And data representing macroeconomic conditions is difficult to obtain in the format of raw data. So we can't really find all of the data about our economy. You know, how many people actually uh, are, are suffering from certain economic conditions? We don't know. We, we make an index up, and we do that based on a sample, and we also assign subjective weights in order to determine the relative significance of those factors. This is what, what Daniel Kahneman did in his early work with Amos Tversky called prospect theory. And, and so this, this ranking and weighting system, it's actually a way that distorts the real effects of happening in the microeconomic world in order to make a macroeconomic estimate. So we see really in macroeconomics, no attention is given to substructures of economic groups. And so findings are expressed only for the total population. And, and we, we see this problem is, is that macroeconomic theory based on general correlations, it's not able to produce specific causes because its enumerative data is insufficient to find a root cause. Thus, the reasons behind macroeconomic change only in a, a theoretical viewpoint based on Bayesian dynamic probabilities. So uncover broad trends, it's necessary to take a closer look at the economic drivers of change. So what does this mean in terms of a macro quality perspective for economics? Well, we see that social badness sometimes counts as economic goodness. So gross domestic product, 
is the sum of all goods and services produced by a nation. And the weakness in the structure is that if we take a look at Taguchi's quality as loss, the loss caused to society after a product has been produced or a service has been delivered. So the cost of badness is often counted as goodness. That's the broken window fallacy. So we start seeing the cost of correcting pollution are counted as economic goodness because they're not recouped from the cost of the original production. The cost of war are counted as a positive economic benefit for goods produced and also positive economic for reconstruction, not for the losses that they created in terms of lives and the economic effect of those lives or the economic effect of the impact on society for what goods and were actually destroyed. Production of inferior goods are counted as a good use of resources because we keep labor involved in sorting and, and uh, uh, repairing, if you will, or dealing with warranty claims. The treatment of hospital-induced infection or a botched uh, operation is actually counted as a health care benefit because it is actually adding to the services that are charged for economic for in, in the healthcare economy. So misallocation of costs results in an improper assessment of value in the microeconomic environment because the true costs of failure or corrective actions are not borne by the producer of the failure, but by society as a whole. So Albert Einstein made a very, uh, I, I think, appropriate comment. He said, not everything that is counted counts, and not everything that counts can actually be counted. So we start thinking about macro quality. We want to distinguish between macro and micro quality. So microeconomics uh, is, is called the theory of the firm because it focuses on the way organizations operate. It's frequently reduced to price theory. Traditionally, the key emphasis on quality has been creating stability in productions, eliminating waste, reducing defects, and all of that is, is concentrated on the cost reduction of pricing theory. Macronomic uh, economics refers to large-scale systems, economic operations of an industry, a society, or a nation for the global interactions between them. So micro, macro quality elevates the concentration of quality to the socio-technical systems that influence quality of life for humanity and of those factors that affect this condition. So a shift from micro quality to macro quality will increase the breadth and depth of quality activities. So macro quality elevates the conversation about quality to a level of society and concentrates on quality for humanity. And we can see this in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this defines their working definition of transcendental quality for all of humanity. And so it's all goodness and no badness for all on planet Earth. And that's the philosophy behind the UN SDGs. Now Deming, when he talked about his theory of knowledge, he, he was observing that social systems uh, have not been structured to capture and learn their cost. So Deming made a comment about quality costs. He said the cost of quality may be unknown and unknowable. And that's because we don't capture what happens outside the firm, like the cost for suppliers or the cost for customers. And so how can we count those costs? So what is, as, as Deming talked about, the, the, the cost of the loss of joy of work or pride in production? What's the cost in resources spent on decision alternatives, not in the best interest of society as a whole? What's the cost of obsolescence that's borne by producers, uh, but it's borne by society to dispose of durable goods? What's the cost of providing unresponsive end-of-life health care? What's the cost of providing substandard education? What's the cost of the loss of youthful optimism or enthusiasm about life? What's the cost of the unintended consequences of human activities? So while it's often said opportunity costs must not be considered in decision, they are real costs when it comes to global social systems. So when we talk about this challenges in implementing macro quality, we start seeing that there have to be some innovations to make this become reality. So macro quality must address the weaknesses that are inherent in macroeconomics. So it must define metrics that fit the financial dilemma that's defined by this broken window fallacy. How do we address uh, repairs based on poor quality and how do we address correction of social costs? So macro quality has to define an interface between the quality of the firm and the quality of society. So macro quality must become a meta standard for quality of life that is suitable for all humanity and based on sustainability and austerity, not on a model, a model of conspicuous, excuse me, not on a model of conspicuous consumption 
that has fueled a consumer-based society and individual financial objectives. So macroeconomic theory needs to be developed so it's coherent to fit the modern concept, doing good while doing no harm, all goodness coupled with no badness. So macro quality is, is the pioneering boundary for all modern developments of quality methods. So it will require a systems approach to meet current socio-technical challenges that are facing society. So the takeaway lesson I have, I'm going back to Voltaire, who in, in 1764 uh, wrote um, uh, this. Uh, he was an Enlightenment philosopher, and I believe that we, we are now entering an age where we have to have enlightenment to understand how this world is really fitting together. And Voltaire made the comment, our wretched species is so made that those who walk on the well-trodden path always throw stones at those who are showing a new road. So if somebody is showing us something new and they're breaking with tradition, we tend to want to, to uh, cast dispersions at them or throw stones at them to destroy that rather than try to understand what is it they're trying to say. So the critical uh, takeaway observations from, from this is that we have this question, how should society account for investments that are intended to correct the unintended consequences of its poorly executed activities across the various economic sectors. So the historical system for calculating GDP does not discourage society from eliminating negative drivers of economic loss. And we have to develop a new economic structure that includes consideration as quality as a motivator of all economic systems, not just a quantity-driven approach towards economic calculations. And so what this webinar has done is address the, the following learning objectives to help you discover challenges your career will face in the future. So understand the role of macroeconomic quality, discover this quality imperative in macroeconomics and why we need to include it there, macro quality initiatives that can influence industrial policy and recognize what you can do to change. And consider what can you do to help advance the economy of your nation. So the mandate is we have to get, if you will, uh, the big numbers about social costs right to assure economic uh, equity in the future. And when I look at this, this is, is part of this structure of forces that is causing the quality community to think in a broader way. And so the economic forces that we've talked about is just one of the six or the five that we'll be talking about. So I wanna thank you for, for having listened to this. We have some time for some Q&A. And uh, uh, we'll come back and talk about the, the next webinars in the series. So, Doug, uh, I've seen some things flash on my, my uh, uh, sideboard here. Have there been some questions coming up? Oh, it's been busy. <laughs> okay. It's been great. Um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the points made was that uh, uh, individual, he'll probably contact you. He says, it's time to tap into the wisdom of the saints and sages from India. They spoke of this ages ago, would be delighted to do a dialogue on that topic and exchange ideas. It's a subject of study for him. So um, you know, you're, going to, you're going to be doing a series in India, you said. So, just yeah, to... would be, and, and I actually studied theistic Vedanta in India some 50 years ago uh, in Sanskrit. So, uh, yeah, I have some, some attachment to the Indian philosophy. Okay, yes, good. He's That's... absolutely right about that. That, that, that was uh, Rai Chowdhury, so he'll he'll contact you. Okay, okay so a uh, couple of questions. Um, one question, actually, one thing that kept coming back and back, people said, oh, this is great, and I, I commented, this could be a reading list. And somebody says, I definitely like the idea of this becoming a reading list. And someone else said, I'd like to ask for references or papers. So let me ask you, would you be interested in just making a reading list, a list of books uh, or articles, and we could then put that in my ASQ? Well, I actually anticipated this as a request. And so anybody who requests, I, I, I don't know, we're, we could probably have several hundred people watching this, but those of you who've requested from me in the past uh, copies of the PDFs of my slides, uh, I, I have provided that. What I haven't told everybody is I often provide supplemental papers, uh, either I've written or others have written that are on topic. And I've identified, I think it's four uh, papers by economists that are very helpful in, in bringing this to flesh summaries of macroeconomic theory or 
particular articles is. I know there's one by Stiglitz there, and, and that can help you to understand. Uh, there's a 1957 paper by uh, Solo uh, that, that started getting this rational effect moving forward. So, so none of those are really talk about where we're going. Those articles actually haven't been written. Uh, I was doing a search last summer to find out what was written about quality and macroeconomics, and the answer was nothing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had one person make a comment to me, a professor of economics. He said, if you bring that out and you can make a, the logical argument, it's worth a Nobel Prize. And, and that's because nobody's tried to figure out how do you deal with quality in a macroeconomic sense. It's too aggregate for them. And I think that that's a wonderful challenge, uh, and I love to be challenged. Uh, so that's what got me off on this in the beginning. So I spent almost a month looking through this, and that's one of the reasons I, I created this part of the Managing for Quality series. But I have four or five papers that will anybody request the PDF, we'll get all of those, and I can certainly share those in. And I think you can put them up on ASQ because I got them off in public domain. Okay, great. We will we will put that into the My ASQ site along with links to this. Um, so you've answered a couple other questions. One of them was, how do you measure macroeconomic quality? What are some metrics? And you're saying, <laughs> don't have them, right? Yeah, they, they don't exist. And, and that's, I think, the real challenge. You know, uh, the microeconomic uh, measures we use, like cost of quality, I don't like because they actually do not reflect how accounting systems work. And, and, and so the professional financial people just dispense. And, and any measurement system we come up with should be one that the professionals in that field can accept. That's one of my bottom lines. So, so it's, we have to rethink this whole financial consideration. Uh, so so uh, I, I wrote a tongue in cheek paper years ago called Accounting for Accounting. And, and, and <laughs> one of my comments was there is no accounting for accounting. And that's because it's all fake numbers. You know, uh, econo uh, excuse me, accountants talk about allocation, that means lying. Uh, because when you're allocating, you say, oh, this number came from there. It didn't, but that's where I'm going to put it, so I'm buying it. And that's how you know, our whole system of economics is. It's just that it's acceptable to lie in that area. But in, in the macro sense, we can't even tell the lies because we have so fooled ourselves with bad data. You know, if, if you take a look at, at, you know, the economic impact of COVID, it's got to be great. But what we start seeing is the cost we're spending on healthcare maintenance for COVID, it's actually considered a positive boost to gross domestic product. Does that really <laughs> seem right? And to me, it feels like there's something wrong for that. And, and so um, if somebody goes in the hospital and they get an infection and we have to treat them for that, that's a positive benefit. And yet, you know, they caught it in the hospital when they're getting care for something else. That doesn't seem right. Uh, it, there's an oil spill, the correction of Collecting that oil spill or, or cleaning it up is a positive benefit on GDP, but it's a negative to society. So we have to figure out how do we get those measures right? I think that's a big challenge for the community. I don't have an answer. Yeah, your, your comment about accounting uh, reminds me of how uh, in classical cost accounting, assets are considered, yeah, I mean, inventory is considered an asset. And yet yeah. under lean, it can be a detriment. Oh, yeah. And, and what's interesting, if you talk about making durable goods like motors or something that's really big, uh, slow-moving assets get counted as corporate assets as a benefit, but you haven't been able to sell them. So it's actually <laughs> a detriment. So it's like yeah. a lot of messed up things with accounting. Got another question here about ISO 26000, Guidance on Social Responsibility. What do you think about that connection to this? Well, I'm going to talk about that in the next lecture. So uh, I'll be talking about social response. So can I beg off on that for another month? I think that's oh. the 11th of February. Okay, good, good. Uh, I'm, try <laughs> I'm trying to catch up with the notes. Yeah, we, we have over 300 people here, so there's, there's lots of stuff coming in. Um, so uh, one question was, you know, we ought to figure out the cost of COVID. You answered that one, too. Uh, no, we don't know what COVID is costing us. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> not everything that counts can be counted. Um, here's one, this is an interesting comment. Uh, the UK Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher, once said, economics are the method 
The object is to change the heart and the soul. Uh, yet we also know that a vital element of quality is to change hearts and minds and souls. Which is the chicken and which is the egg in this mission? Oh, God. I mean, that's the old uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's the old chicken and egg conversation. I don't know. I, I've never been able to figure that out. Um, what I do know is you've got to grab an egg and, and, and fry it. And the egg has to, if, if you're frying it, you can't make a chicken. So you're making some choices. If I take the chicken and I make chicken nuggets, I'm making another choice. I don't get eggs anymore. So we have to set a purposeful objective for what we want to achieve. And with that purposeful objective, I can optimize chickens or eggs, but I have to make choices. How's that for a go-round? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good answer to an unsolvable problem. Here's another one from, uh, from Naheem. Um, how do you see quality system standards in the future, incorporating any requirements to evaluate these financial aspects of quality? Now, I will tell you that I prepared a paper for ISO on cost of quality, but it's, it's the classical cost of quality, not looking at it from the point of view that you're discussing here. Yeah, well, I see standards, um, you know how Duran talked about big Q and little q, and I see standards as being big S and little s. So little s are work standards, what you actually do. It's a work instruction. It's in the workplace. Big s are the regulatory standards, whether they're voluntary or non-voluntary, and that's about the, the constraints that you're putting on organizations and how they operate. Both of those deal with microeconomics and microquality. There are no standards, if you will, for the macro world. So, so what we see there are uh, they're negotiated covenants uh, or treaties, if you will, for how we want to treat things. So it's so like World Trade Center operates on these, these treaties about how things are the world, and, and we hold them up as if it was international law, if you will, but it is not enforceable in exactly the same way. And that's why we get into these trade conflicts and so forth. And, and people are trying to, to apply that, that I can you know, trade off soybeans uh, somehow for, for glass or something like this in a trade war. And, and no, you're not hurting the same people. You're hurting different people in the economy. And, and there's actually no way to, to determine how you actually hurt the people you want to, but you're hurting the nation as a whole. Uh, and, and that is then creating a uh, lack of uh, uh, focus, if you will, in terms of who is the, the benefactor or who is the person who is being punished by those types of global issues. And that's where we get the inequity in the system. And so that inequity, if I, if I have a, a trade war happening between uh, two countries, it may be a third country that's, that's actually being penalized because they cannot uh, operate their market the same way either. So the macroeconomic stuff has to be well thought out. It's a complex system. Uh, I don't think there are any easy answers, but I think we have to start thinking at that level. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Uh, this this is absolutely you know cutting edge stuff. So here here's another question. This comes from Jane. Um, capturing measures of quality goodness, those intangibles that contribute to quality but aren't easy to measure. What or how can these be captured and incorporated into economic models? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, that actually gets to to the uh, emphasis on Joseph Schumpeter. Um, it reminds me of the work of Genrich Altschulder when he created TRIZ or TREES, <laughs> uh, Theory of Inventive Problem Solving, because he did that by studying patents and trying to figure out the innovative potential. And, and innovations are this intangible property or intellectual property. And I think that, that what you start finding is that, that there's some real questions in terms of how do you deal with intellectual property. So most of the disputes about intellectual property are at the micro level based on uh, things that have happened at the macro level. So for instance, we have in Hollywood some artists who were saying, we don't like the way China as a nation is making copies of our CDs and selling our music cheap. Okay, that's just an example. There's intellectual property. It got escalated from the micro level of an entertainer who owned it originally. And now that there is a macro level com country who is having gray goods, if you will, uh, and and reducing the economic effect for the micro person. But, but did that actually flow to China as a, company, a country or to some small firm that's actually doing this? 
So, so the, there, there's so much complexity in this whole situation, the crossovers between micro and macro, uh, that we'll, we're going to have to deal with this as a systems model. This is going to be one of those things where the technologies of quality 4.0, our ability to simulate environments and to be able to study them uh, in some sort of uh, uh, three-dimensional world, if you will, on, on a computer system through simulation, that those will become necessities. And so what the economists have been doing in terms of studying models, I think it's basically wrong because they're, they're, they're so aggregating things, they can't tell us what any causal systems are. They can tell you the likelihood of risks or probability of things happening, but again, they're not reporting everything at very high confidence levels. And, and so as we start looking at things, I remember uh, uh, one of the, the books that I really enjoyed, which is The Functions of the Executive by Chester Bernard, 1938. There's a Harvard book as one of the two most important books in the last century in terms of, of management principles, the other being Taylor's book on, on uh, principles of scientific management. But what, what uh, Bernard observed was that there's seven levels of data that we can say something with confidence. The first level is I have physical hard data. I'm talking about measurements of steel. And the bottom one was, was religion. But just above religion was politics. And just above, that's like, you know, what's going to happen in elections. And just above that was the economic models we use for estimating social benefits. And, and above that was, was things like, you know, blood pressure and health and so forth. So it's like, as you start getting down, economics is not something that we can say with great surety what it's actually doing. Okay, so the, the, the questions have gone in so many different directions. Um, and we have a minute left. I'm, I'm, I don't see any way that I can do a fair job of collecting all these ideas. And so what we're gonna do here is we're going to uh, we're, we're just going to cover off a few closing items. Um, so we'll, we'll stop our recording at this point.